There have been many despicable acts carried out throughout human history in the name of various religious beliefs, but today we're focusing on disturbing cases particularly related to satanic beliefs and the occult. I'm your host James and these are the top 10 evil people who came face to face with the devil himself. And we're starting things off with David Berkowitz, aka the son of Sam. One peculiar aspect of his case was his claim that his neighbor's dog was possessed and instructed him to commit of violent acts. In the mid 1970s, Berkowitz carried out a string of shootings. He was eventually arrested in 1977, and during the investigation, he admitted to the shootings and claimed that his neighbor's dog, a black Labrador retriever named Harvey, was possessed by a demon. According to Berkowitz, Harvey commanded him to take the lives of people. Berkowitz later asserted that he had started the fires in the Bronx, attributing this act to the dog's influence as well. In 1978, Berkowitz pleaded guilty to the crimes and was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences in prison. He later renounced his satanic beliefs and became involved in prison ministry, offering counseling and support to other inmates. And at number nine, we have Sean Sellers. He was a self-proclaimed Satanist who claimed to be possessed by a demon named Azaret. In 1985, at the age of 16, Sellers took the lives of his parents, Vonda and Paul, in their Oklahoma home. He later confessed to these acts, as well as having shot a convenience store clerk a year prior who refused to sell him beer. Sellers stated that his involvement in Satanism influenced his actions. According to Sellers, he believed he was possessed by the demon, which drove him to commit the violent acts. And Sellers was eventually arrested, tried, and convicted for the crimes. He was sentenced to death in 1986, and during his time on death row, he became a born-again Christian and renounced his previous involvement in Satanism but despite his change in beliefs and multiple appeals, Sellers was executed by lethal injection in 1999. Next up is Manuela and Daniel Ruda, two lovers bound together by their passion for violence in the name of the Dark Lord. How romantic. Manuela and Daniel Ruda were a German couple involved in a highly disturbing incident in 2001. They were responsible for the death of Frank Hackert and their reason for taking their friend's life? Well, according to the couple at the time, they thought he was so funny and would be the perfect court jester for Satan. The Rudas were deeply immersed in occult practices, spending time vacationing in England and Scotland, sleeping in graveyards, and going to devil worshipping parties. The couple subjected Hacker to hours of violent rituals, which tragically led to his demise. After taking Hackert's life, they stuck his body in a coffin that they used as a coffee table. They attempted to dismember his body, but they were apprehended before they could dispose of the remains. They were actually caught in a gas station, and apparently they were brandishing chainsaws, like waiting for the authorities to arrive. Very insane. In 2002, they were both convicted of the crime, with Daniel receiving a prison sentence and Manuela being committed to a psychiatric institution because of her diminished mental state. She cut her ties with Daniel when he was in prison, though, and he landed himself in court once again years later when he apparently attempted to hire a hitman to take her out. True love at its finest. As insane as all this is, using a coffin for a coffee table, that is actually an awesome idea. I am taking note of that. Nikolai Ogolbiak. This next case happened in 2008 in Russia. It's pretty disturbing. Nikolai was a former choir boy turned Satanist and led a small cult of Satan worshippers. He and a few of his underlings lured four teenagers in the local goth scene into the woods, about 300 miles northeast of Moscow, where they forced them to drink alcohol before stabbing them 666 times each. After that, they ate parts of their victims' bodies. The group was arrested when various body parts were found in Nikolai's apartment complex. One member was quoted saying, Satan will help me avoid responsibility. I made many sacrifices to him. Another said, I tried to turn to God, but it didn't bring me any money. I prayed to Satan and things improved. They didn't improve that much because now you're in prison, but. Yeah. Number six, the Beasts of Satan. The members of the Beasts of Satan were primarily young individuals in the metal scene in Soma, Lombardo, Italy. They shared an interest in Satanism and the occult, and they believed in ritualistic practices influenced by the darker aspects of Satanic worship. One night in January of 1998, after hanging out at Midnight Pub listening to heavy metal music, three members, Andrea Volpe, Nicola Sapone, and Mario Muccione, lured two of their friends out into the woods. 
and took their lives in a ritualistic sacrifice. They buried their bodies in the woods and then danced on their graves chanting, now you're both zombies, try to get out of this hole if you dare. Might have sounded catchier in Italian. The group got away with this initially. Authorities didn't look into the two teens disappearances because they were a couple and police were like, oh yeah, they probably ran off together. Great policing work. Then in 2004, the group's leader, Andre Volpe, uh, took the life of his ex-girlfriend, believing she knew too much about the incident from seven years prior. Then he and his buddy buried the body before taking a large amount of drugs, crashing their car into a tree. The two were arrested, and during interrogations, everything came out. Next on the list is Ricky Queso. In 1984, Ricky Queso, a teenager from Northport, New York, took the life of his friend Gary Lowers. On June 16th, 1984, Queso and a group of friends, who were all part of a group they called the Knights of the Black Circle, lured Lowers to a remote wooded area. There, a conference Confrontation ensued, during which Queso and his accomplices subjected Lowers to a drawn out beating. Queso apparently tried to force Lowers into praising Satan. Lowers refused, though, repeating that he loved his mother. The entire group was high on psychedelic drugs at the time. Queso would then brag about the incident to his friends days afterwards, claiming that Satan had appeared to him in the form of a black crow. When it cawed, he interpreted it as, as Satan giving his approval of the attack. This was at the height of the satanic panic in the US and Queso's fascination with satanic rituals and the occult and the fact that he was wearing an ACDC t-shirt when he was arrested. It all became the focal point in the media coverage of the case. And shortly after the incident, Queso was arrested and charged in connection with Lauer's demise. And before he could stand trial though, he took his own life in his jail cell on July 7th of 84. Number four, the Ripper Crew. The Ripper Crew was a notorious satanic cult active in Chicago during the 80s, comprising of four members, Robert, Get, Edward, Spritzer, and brothers Andrew and Thomas Cocorellis. They carried out a series of heinous crimes, abducting and taking the lives of several women in the area. They followed this twisted version of Satanism, using it as a justification for their violent acts. Their leader, Robin Get, allegedly believed that offering human sacrifices to Satan, he would then gain supernatural powers and protection. The Ripper crew targeted young women. They adopted their victims, subjected them to brutal torment, and then took their lives as part of their ritualistic practices. In 82, the police arrested Robert Getz. During his interrogation, he confessed to several crimes and provided information about the cult's activities. And this led to the arrest and conviction of the other members, including Edward Spritzer and the Coco Reilly's brothers. But it's essential to, uh, I want to say, their actions aren't really representative of mainstream Satanism. I think that this goes for everyone on this list. In real life, Satanism really is not about promoting violence. Anyway, in 83, Robert Gett was sentenced to 120 years in prison. Edward Spritzer and Andrew Cocorellis were sentenced to death, with Spritzer later receiving a life sentence after Illinois temporarily banned the death penalty. And Thomas Cocorellis was actually released from prison in 2019 for some reason. Next on the list, we have Krista Pike. In January 1995, Krista Gail Pike, who was 18 at the time, along with two accomplices, Shadola Peterson and Tadariel Ship, Pike's boyfriend, were were involved in a gruesome incident that claimed the life of classmate Colleen Slemmer. Pike had a disturbing interest in Satanism and the occult and carried out the act in a particularly disturbing manner. So it all started when Slemmer seemed to be talking to her boyfriend a little too much for Krista's liking. So she formed a plan with Ship and Peterson to take Slemmer out of the picture. The trio lured Slemmer to a vacant steam plant where they violently attacked her. They beat her for 30 minutes, cut her up, even carved a pentagram into her chest. In 1996, Krista Pike was convicted of her role in the event and despite her young age, was sentenced to death. She's currently still on death row. Number two, Richard Ramirez, or he, as he became known, the Night Stalker, one of the most notorious criminals in American history. Ramirez was heavily influenced by Satanism and he often left satanic symbols at the 
scenes of his crimes. He was known to drop pentagrams in the walls and leave occult objects behind. Ramirez believed that he was protected by dark forces and that Satan guided his actions. During 84 and 85, Ramirez took the lives of at least 13 people in Southern California. His victims, ranging in age from 9 to 83, were subjected to brutal attacks, and in some cases, uh, he would also burglarize the people's homes. He would also force many of his victims to profess their love uh, for Satan. Unlike a lot of criminals of his kind who typically have a specific pattern to the types of people they'll victimize, Ramirez was more unpredictable. His victims were were almost entirely random. Men, women, young, old, didn't matter to him. Now, the way this all ends is probably the most cathartic I've heard in any notorious criminal uh, case like this. In 1985, Ramirez was chased down by residents in East Los Angeles after they recognized him from news coverage. An angry mob formed and Ramirez was just romped on uh, until police showed up. It's like the ending of Frankenstein or something. Only Ramirez actually deserved what he got. He was unarrested, tried, and convicted. He died in 2013 while on death row in San Quentin. Finally, we have Adolfo Constanzo. This guy was a cult leader, uh, a drug trafficker, and he also practiced black magic. Man was just looking at the villain menu was like, yep, I'll have that. I'll take that. Might as well check that off as well. Uh, he was the mastermind behind a criminal organization involved in drug trafficking, and he would take victims' lives in these spooky, dark rituals. He believed that performing human sacrifices would grant him supernatural powers and protect his drug trafficking operations. Cult members followed his twisted beliefs without question, basically the definition of a cult. The cult's rituals often involved human sacrifice. Victims were often abducted or lured and then died in ceremonies aimed at appeasing deities and spirits. Their bodies were dismembered and body parts were used in the rituals. In 1989, Constanzo's criminal activities began to unravel when Mexican authorities discovered the cult's headquarters in Matamoros, Mexico, and there they found evidence of the cult's rituals, including human remains and ritualistic artifacts. There's this big witch's type cauldron with a dead black cat and a human brain inside of it. Doesn't seem real. Constanzo and four of his followers fled but were eventually tracked down by the police and Constanzo didn't want to be taken alive and so he ordered one of his followers to shoot him and that was the end of that. With all that said, I've been your host James and I'll catch you, yes you specifically, in the next video. Mm -hmm.